question is not whether or not the viaduct is going to come down. The question is, what are we going to do to replace the viaduct? Well, there's been, I think, too much focus on various cost estimates and on looking at the viaduct as purely, or its replacement as purely a transportation issue. It's much bigger than that. There has been very little discussion beyond the transportation project. You know, it's, a tr it's an important transportation corridor, we all know that. The implications are vast, I think, for the city, for downtown, for the waterfront, for our citizens, uh, for economic development, for parks and open space, and to deal with the transportation problem at the same time. But clearly there's much more at stake here for the future of Seattle. The opportunity that it's, that's presented by the potential removal of the viaduct is extraordinary. I mean, it is the opportunity to create an entirely new waterfront um, is amazing. And that's what needs to be discussed. I mean, we need to start talking about a new, uh, a whole new front door to the city, a new, as the mayor calls it, a front porch, which I really like. You must have mobility and good urban design at the same time. You cannot do things any other way. Uh, what we're really talking about is places for people to live, neighborhoods that people want to be in. Uh, places to work that are comfortable and where people are excited and happy about being in those places. Uh, and so that means good urban design. And mobility is how you get from one place to the other. But if you don't want to be in one of those places, there's no point in having the mobility. We need to have the foresight today. We need to be thinking 100 years into the future and what kind of legacy we want to leave, what kind of legacy this generation wants to leave for future generations and for our children and for their children and their children. It's clearly my bias, but I believe pretty strongly that, that great cities, that there's no great city in the world that doesn't have great public spaces and that you simply can't have a great urban environment without great public space. If we don't have um, those areas of the city for relaxation, for reprieve from the hustle and bustle, uh, we, would, we would just go crazy. And clearly, clearly we don't have enough open space in downtown today. Seattle has less public open space in its downtown than any city in America. Um, and that, you know, isn't just a statistic. I mean, it's important in terms of quality of life. The waterfront is an opportunity for us to partly take care of that open space. It can provide the kind of destination major park that will be one part of providing open space. It needs to be supplemented with a bunch of neighborhood parks of things that are actually really close and convenient within several blocks of people for an open space and park system to really work. But, but the waterfront can be like Central Park is for New York City, the place where people really gather and congregate and see as their, their major sort of uh, park and open space opportunity. It shouldn't look like Central Park, it shouldn't function like Central Park, but it should be great public space like Central Park. And that's what we should be thinking about, about setting the standard for a whole new generation, not just a generation, for a whole new century of, of the city. <laughs>what they did when they were invited to come to Seattle in 1903 and prepare a park plan and boulevard plan of course is now being celebrated as a centennial in this year 2003 and rightfully I mean it's a marvelous thing that happened that that, that they were invited out here to bring all their experience and to apply it so gently and diversely to our local uh, our local cityscape to, to mix our cityscape with landscape the whole concept of bringing the Olmsteads here was extremely controversial. 
It was not something that uh, that everybody said, "Oh, great, we'll have an Olmsted system, and uh, it's you know it's just routine sort of thing to do." It was a dramatic change in the city's landscape. And if you look at those areas where those parks and boulevards exist today, they are um, they have maintained an incredible legacy, the value, the kind of sense of um, quality in those in that, those parts of the city, and they really set the stage for how that those parts of the cities. The, uh, the city developed. That kind of sensitivity, that spirit, it seems to me should be carried, you know, in a, in a soft, decorated, gilded basket to the waterfront. Let's make the waterfront really what it could be. You know, those were people who were really looking towards the future and saying 50 or 100 years from now, people are going to thank us for this, despite the controversy at the time. Well, I think we ought to be thinking 50 or 100 years from now, what are people going to thank us for? I think the hope should be, when you use the uh, Olmsted uh, reference and comparison, is that in the year 2103, or some year soon after that, uh, the locals should be celebrating uh, the vision that the people of our time had to, to solve the problem of the waterfront. I think the urban design aspect of the project is actually the crucial part of the project in terms of what we're going to do with the waterfront. In terms of the transportation system, that's almost a separate issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, we're dealing with that in, at the same time because of the fact that we've got our transportation system right on the waterfront. But there's no necessary reason to have the transportation system on the waterfront. I think, unfortunately, a lot of American cities have degraded their waterfronts, have done just what was done here with uh, this uh, uh, awful uh, dismal structure that really destroyed the waterfront. It is our opportunity to do something for future generations. The choice is another double-decked freeway or a great civic urban space. And I guess one, I guess the basic question is should we be using our main waterfront at, for a highway? I mean it's just sort of uh, uh, a basic fundamental question. You know, it's, it's not every generation that you get the opportunity to take nine acres of the most precious urban land in all of a region and then reconfigure that to go from a nightmare to a dream. And that's the opportunity we have ahead of us. The question is, can we think about it more creatively rather than just moving cars? Um, I think that uh, in an ideal world, what we would have been able to do is have a great waterfront plan in place that suggests how the, the transportation corridor fits within a plan rather than having a plan react to a transportation project, which is kind of the position that we're in. The urban design ought to be driving the sort of core design element of the waterfront and then the transportation planning is absolutely essential to do right, but that transportation planning has to fit into the way the urban design ought to work. You can look at the waterfront as, you know, as an aesthetic scar uh, from a variety of from a variety of senses: eye, ear, uh, smell. But you can also look at it as a uh, neglected economic venue or milieu. You can look at it from the from the pocketbook. Well, um, the viaduct right now is. Uh, it's a deteriorated structure. It needs to be replaced in some fashion. It cuts off the waterfront from the city and vice versa. Um, it, one of the things that I find most offensive about the viaduct is that it's is the noise level. One can stand on the edge of the waterfront right now uh, and not be able to have a normal conversation. I mean, I like the sound of the city, but I like it to be, have a variation, a diversity to it, not this constant high decibel roar of traffic. And knowing that it's mixed with this uh, elixir of uh, carbon dioxide uh, doesn't help. The existence of a viaduct or any overhead structure makes for an environment that isn't particularly pleasant. And if that's what Seattle wants in its future, that's fine. I mean, I, you know, I, think, I think this community has to decide what it wants. I think people need to stand up and say what they want there. 
if we as citizens of this community don't um, let our voices be known and say, hey, here are the things that we want, here's what it would make a great waterfront for all, then we're losing the opportunity. I want this thing to go smooth and, 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 and by the numbers. <laughs> I think a great question um, to, to kind of figure out where people feel um, um, kind of most comfortable a, a gathering is where people spontaneously gather after a sports team wins a championship. And if you look at other cities, there are, there are places that have repeatedly combinated that kind of activity. You know, Seattle needs to have a place where people can come and celebrate en masse. Um, and the waterfront, based on the fact that Seattle is such a, a sea-loving town, is the natural place for us to go. Isn't it ironic that we have a seafair parade and you can't see the water, and yet it's called seafair, you know? Uh, so wouldn't it be fabulous to have a boulevard on the waterfront that the seafair parade could be coming down and you could see the water as the backdrop to the parade? Our society, our city, has not cared about the waterfront in a way that it meets the needs for the, the residents of the Northwest. And by tearing down the viaduct, then all of a sudden you've got this blank canvas where we as a society can say, all right, what are the kinds of amenities do we want? What do we need? And then let's build those there. In fact, I, I personally find it a bit offensive that people suggest we should keep the structure so that people can have three minutes of view as they're driving by on 50 miles an hour when that structure really degrades the waterfront. What I would see the waterfront as providing is an entree so that people come in, they see the waterfront, say if they're coming off of a cruise ship, they see it as an inviting place that brings them up to downtown, that brings them up to the market, that brings them up to the shopping area, that brings them up to a great sculpture garden, that brings, that has, and maybe there'll be a lot of public sculpture at other places around the downtown, so people can really experience as a destination, not just as a place to check off. There's all sorts of possibilities. Um, what if we designed, you know, some of the edges of our buildings to accommodate outdoor movies that you could see from, a water, from the water, you know? I see lots of concerts, as well as small musical activities taking place all along the way. Um, I see jugglers and uh, street musicians and uh, buskers and people like that. Um, I think the other thing that, that should happen is that the design of the buildings and of the whole system, the whole waterfront system, should reflect the very highest quality of architecture and land use planning, uh, well integrated open spaces, eyes on those open spaces so that you've got things that will actually be safe and comfortable for people, uh, lots of sidewalk opportunities, op uh, good pedestrian access, uh, and residences and commercial really well mixed so that you've got people who actually are living on the waterfront experiencing it and making that a part of their daily life as well as working here. Those are the kind of components I think we ought to look at. I'm absolutely confident that if you build another replacement viaduct, an aerial structure, then people are not going to want to go there. 
because people don't want to hang out underneath a uh, freeway. It's just not a fun place to be. That, you know, that's the last place in the world anybody chooses to go. Seattleites don't really have a connection to the central waterfront um, uh, because it's always been uh, kind of cut off from their daily experience and from their uh, kind of activities that they would like to do. There isn't um, a lot of reason to go there. You go down to the waterfront and what you'll see is it's a space for cars. There are 13 lanes, counting the parking lanes, and if you take away the viaduct, then you have an opportunity to put places for people, not just for cars. The car is fundamentally a way to get through places. The pedestrian is a way to experience being in a place. And the pedestrian is the person who's going to be stopping and eating their lunch in the cafe, buying something in the stores. It's not a place where you can sit outside in a cafe because it's exceptionally unpleasant with the noise of the viaduct. It doesn't feel like a place that you want to spend a lot of time. Right now, you can't go down there and just throw a frisbee. There's not a place to do that. You can't go down and have a picnic. You can't um, go rollerblading easily. What we need is a waterfront where people can go for a picnic or to walk their dog, to go rollerblading, um, to ride their bike, uh, just to go for a stroll.
that's it.